Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. Welcome to another episode in the Mecha Anime and Anti-Technological Philosophy series. In this second lecture, we'll move on to consider the rise of the real robot genre through focusing on the show Mobile Suit Gundam in particular. This is a response to a patron's request as a part of the School of Forbidden Text. Remember, you can join us there too for the extremely low price of just $2 per month. Links to both my Patreon and subscribe to our accounts in the video description. We also begin with the disclaimer that this video is for educational purposes alone. Now, I noted in that first lecture that you have this big shift with Mobile Suit Gundam from the super robot genre, which had been dominant in the 1970s, to the real robot genre, basically at the very end of that decade, when, among other things, for the first time, you see humans piloting the mecha on both the protagonist side and also on that of the enemy. In an earlier super robot show like Mazinger Z, the mecha and the humans were always only ever on the protagonist's side. And they were always fighting against enemies who were not only dehumanized, but were also completely unrealistic, fictitious things like, say, giant space lizards. And this was really done so that those enemies never had to be problematized with regard to things like their motivations or their emotions or other things that would uh, lie within the interior space of their own psychological and um, spiritual uh, dimension which we would assume simply does not exist for the kinds of monsters we see there. Even the human um, villain within Mazinger Z, Dr. Hell, is nominally human, but is portrayed in such a way with the weird-looking skin and eyes, strange colors that he has, as basically being, at best, a demon, and at worst, just another sort of unrealistic alien, like the sort of space lizards, who really exist in that show for the sole purpose of providing unliving cannon fodder to be blown up each week by the sort of machines piloted by their humans who are unquestionably super superior to them, not only physically, but also, of course, morally. By having humans pilot Mecha on both sides, both that of the protagonist and that of the villain, within the real robot genre, for the first time, the enemy is quite literally humanized, and for that reason, their interiority, their psychological and spiritual motivations, emotions, beliefs, etc., have to be problematized. For this reason, the real robot genre has to work with narratological conventions, which are inherently more complicated than those of the super robot genre. Even to the point of blurring the traditional distinction between shonen and shoujo, anime. This is a distinction which actually goes back to the pre-anime era, all the way back to, say, the 1930s, with magazines being marketed in Japan on strict gender lines. Now, shonen is the Japanese word for a boy, and is not coincidentally the word which the protagonist of Mobile Suit Gundam is called, both by the other characters who speak to him and by the anonymous narrator who speaks at, say, the beginning of the episodes. He's called shonen because he's quite literally a boy fitting with the buildings, roman conventions of the mecha anime genre, in which you may have noticed typically the uh, giant robot is being piloted or are controlled paradoxically by a person who is not only much smaller as any human would be, but um, one who is actually just on the threshold of crossing from childhood into adolescence, typically, like, say, 12 years old. And this is um, something which does, in a certain sense, fit with the marketing convention for shonen uh, magazines going all the way back to the 1930s to be aimed at boys, whereas shoujo magazines would be aimed at girls. But the difference between the sort of concerns you see in each divided on such strict gender lines um, are things which are no longer as tenable with Mobile Suit Gundam, in the sense that the shonen magazines being marketed to young boys would typically concern themselves with stories about outward practical action, things like, say, battles and adventures. And this would be done in order to prepare these young men for the kinds of leadership roles in um, society that they would be expected to take up. And the 1930s especially, that still included things like uh, military 
uh, ventures, which of course became impossible after the defeat in World War II when the emphasis shifted more to, say, uh, going to war within the business world, but still the idea of having stories about outward practical action in, say, battle, whether it's merely figurative in the business world or not, um, would still come to define the shonen genre, in contrast with the shoujo genre, which would be aimed at young girls and would instead focus on those interior concerns like emotions, human relationships, and um, psychological states, etc. Well, this distinction between the outward orientation of shonen anime and the inward orientation of shoujo anime would be called into question with the rise of the real robot genre, as once again both sides come to be piloted by humans, you have no choice except to problematize the narratological disclosure of the interior states of both heroes and villains, even as you are still having a very heavy emphasis on that outward orientation towards battle. And for this reason, when you have a combination of that outward orientation towards battle and that inward orientation towards psychological states, motivations, and emotions, the result is that things that maybe happened in the super robot genre, like death, are portrayed very differently in the real robot genre. When somebody dies in Mobile Suit Gundam, we feel their pain, whether they're um, on the hero side or the villain for that matter, we feel their pain in a way that simply would not have been possible within the super robot genre. Because once again, in a show like Mazinger Z, the villains are these unrealistic giant space lizards which exist for no reason except to be blown up. And at the worst stages of super robot genre, they exist for no reason except to uh, provide advertising to sell toys. Um, the uh, conventions, even at a business level, for mecha anime in the 1970s reached the point that the toy companies would become sponsors of the anime shows in order to use them as a technology of advertisement to drive up toy sales. And this is exactly what led Mobile Suit Gundam itself to be a failure the first time it ran. It actually um, had to so um, few toy sales relative to the expectations for the typical show within the super robot genre that it ended up uh, being uh, pulled um, before uh, it was able to finish all of the episodes that had originally been planned. They originally planned 52 episodes, but they had to cut it down to 43, which is why if you watch the show, the ending seems a little bit uh, rushed. It quite frankly seems that some things that would have uh, had more time to be explained or kind of just rushed out into the open, like this concept of the new type, etc. Well, the reason for that actually was that um, considered in terms of the conventions of the super robot genre, Mobile Suit Gundam was a failure because it didn't meet the requirements of simply driving up the toy, sa the toy sales of its sponsor company through providing a monster of the week um, sort of entertainment for uh, kids who were very young. Rather, this was a show which they noted was paradoxically too complicated to be followed by kids because it was more oriented towards telling serious stories to adults. And this is something which maybe could be taken for granted today, that of course mecha anime is mature storytelling, even regarding the uh, possibility of dialogue about the most serious issues like humans' relation to modern technology is maybe going beyond what a Ted Kaczynski or Jacques Ellul could explain away within the West. Well, we take it for granted that that should be the case today, that that's what anime, and especially mech anime, should do, but that's only because we have the benefit of hindsight this many decades later. In 1979 itself, uh, Mobile Suit Gundam was actually seen as something of a failure and only had a revival in the early 1980s when um, the reruns of the show actually performed much better than the original run. And the show itself was also reworked into three movies, which led to a rebirth of interest not only in this show, but also in um, the sort of narratological conventions which had opened up which led to the rise of the real robot genre as such. In 1981, the first real robot show as such 
debuted under the title of Fang of the Sun Du Gram or Taiyo no Ha Da Guramu in Japanese. And for this reason, Mobile Suit Gundam is considered the point at which Mecha split into two very different genres. The super robot genre that had been dominant in the 1970s had its presuppositions fundamentally overturned by this new genre for all of the reasons which we will consider in greater detail within this episode. Now, the first big difference between the super robot genre and the real robot genre we'll talk about now is the irony that technology itself is presented in an untechnological manner within the super robot genre. Now, that might sound like a meaningless tautology. There is nothing technological about technology within the super robot genre, but uh, what I mean by that is that technology in the super robot genre is portrayed in the same way that magic is portrayed within the fantasy genre. So if you're watching a fantasy film where a wizard, for example, has superpowers, you never ask for a quasi-scientific explanation for how those superpowers function because you understand that there would be no logical response to that question anyway. Precisely because it is magic, and precisely because the genre is fantasy, you're not supposed to ask how these powers work or where they came from. You're simply supposed to allow a suspension of disbelief to occur on your part so that the narrative can keep trotting along. And actually, within the super robot genre, the robots work in just about the same way. Insofar as an explanation is provided for their origin, it's largely a one-of-a-kind event, like, say, um, the product of an alien civilization that brought it from another planet and dropped it here. That's kind of the explanation of Superman's powers. Well, he was one kind of event from an alien planet dropped onto the Earth, and that's all we can say about it. Or maybe it's the product of a mad genius, in which case, once he dies, his results can never be replicated because his mind is a one-of-a-kind happenstance event in the history of the world. Or maybe they were left behind by an ancient civilization from so far back in the past that we cannot once again, perform any interrogation as to asking for a logical explanation of how they were able to get that result. And the humans' relations to their technology is similarly uninterested in technological or quasi-scientific explanation, insofar as the teenagers in Mazinger Z know how to use their robots for fighting all they really know how to do is to shout out voice commands, typically saving the signature move of the robot for the climax of the battle, in which case they'll shout out the most important move and have the robot finish off the villain with it in much the same way that in Mortal Kombat, the fatality of each character, their unique signature move would be saved for the very end. And this is a relation to technology which really makes it impossible to even raise the kinds of questions um, that uh, Kaczynski and Ori Lulian critique would uh, entertain towards technology except in the purely negative sense that this is obviously not the way that technology functions in the real world. Well, that dialogue becomes much more possible with the rise of the real robot genre because now you have to have some sort of quasi-scientific explanation for how all of these things work. Even the question of why the robots are still using swords for battle, which I had brought up in that first lecture as from my viewpoint, really, among other things, a need to present a symbol of tradition within a world that would seem to the naive viewer to be beyond that of tradition. So the sword is an important solar symbol within the world of tradition, indicating, among other things, the legitimacy of rule as you find uh, King Arthur able to pull a stone that no one else can lift, with equivalents in Greek and Persian mythology. And for that reason, in Star Wars, even though they're within a um, spaceship, which is larger than any that could be built according to laws of physics, they're still using the seemingly outdated, completely obsolete technology of swords when they're fighting each other as elites on both sides, as Jedi Knights uh, fighting the Sith, right? And this is something which um, on one level does indeed need to happen because of the symbols of tradition. But the real robot genre in Mobile Suit Gundam actually does provide, in addition to a traditionalist 
explanation for why the sword needs to be used actually does provide a quasi-scientific explanation, which really goes back to their notion of the Minovsky particle. The Minovsky particle is a technology of radar interference which disrupts long-distance weapons by allowing ships to obscure their locations. This makes long-distance attacks against them useless and places fighter planes at a similar disadvantage, ironically forcing the elite warriors in their mecha to um, go back to things like swords. In fact, the fourth episode, Char himself remarks, quote unquote, now that technology has advanced so far, we're forced to revert to a fighting face-to-face -face like we did in old times. Now, this is once again something which does have an explanation in the traditionalist sense of the sword being a symbol of the sun and a symbol of the legitimacy of rule, but it also has a quasi-scientific explanation which lends uh, the real robot genre to have a greater level of reality than the super robot genre would ever bother to concern itself with. Another major change was that the story itself became far more complicated within the real robot genre and could no longer be contained in a single episode. Now that might sound obvious that the story can't be contained in just one episode if it has dozens of them, but really within the super robot genre it was the case that each episode was its own story with a recyclable plotline. Each week you would see a new monster show up threatened to attack the Earth, and then be predictably, reliably destroyed by the good guys and their good machines, so that the next week you could see a superficially different villain repeat the story all over again. You could miss a week of such a show and still know what was going on, but in contrast with the real robot genre, the story itself becomes once again too big to be contained in just one episode. You have a single story continuously developed over dozens of episodes in a show like, say, Mobile Suit Gundam, in which you have to see every episode to know what is going on. This is what led the critics of the show to say, when it first appeared, um, that it was too difficult for kids to follow. But of course, that's exactly what allows it to open up a space for a serious discussion of things like, say, humans' relation to technology in a way that goes beyond even the Illulian or Kaczynskian critique thereof. Another big change is that whereas the super robot genre was typically limited to planet Earth, it was Earth which was invaded by the aliens, but it was Earth where the good guys and their good robots would defeat them. In Gundam, the characters themselves spend some time on Earth. There's that memorable episode where they're um, entering the atmosphere and they see something which they think is enemy fire, and uh, one uh, uh, person on the ship says, no, 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 I remember, I have a vague memory of this from years ago when I was on Earth. I think this is called lightning. We don't need to be afraid. Well, this is something which uh, was uh, a difference for the real robot genre from the super robot genre because they spend most of their time outside the Earth. In fact, the premise of Mobile Suit Gundam is that um, a set of space colonies outside the Earth had to be set up because of uh, certain conditions that forced them out of the Earth, and it was one of those space colonies, Xeon, that rebelled, leading to the war which we see in this show. Another big difference is etymological in nature. Now, it's almost impossible to even talk about something like Mobile Suit Gundam without unwittingly falling back on the word robot. In fact, we call it the real robot genre, but you might be surprised to remember that um, the word robot is never actually used within the show Mobile Suit Gundam. Not even once do they refer to these things as robots. Rather, there's a new term they coin, which is uh, mobile suit, or quite literally within Japanese, transliterated as mobiro suitzu, which is not coincidentally, I think, a very different portrayal of these machines than would be the case if you fell back on the old Slavic word robot. Now, the word robot really comes from the Czech word for a worker in the sense of a slave. In Russian, you may know the uh, very phrase, I work is ya robotayo. So the Slavic word robot really tells us that the machine is something which exists for the sole purpose 
of slaving away to realize the desires of the master, really in that sort of primitive sense you see in Hegel's slave-master dialectic, in which the first and most primitive social relation is one in which the master feels that he has a desire, he forces the slave to work to realize it, like say he's hungry, the slave will do the work to provide him with food, but for that very reason the master cannot realize his own subjectivity and becomes a mindless consumer whose desires appear and then vanish in a never-ending cycle of false infinity. Only the slave within the Hegelian slave-master dialectic can realize a higher level of subjectivity because he works. Well, that's really the sort of primitive relation implied in the word robot in which um, the humans view their machines as these unliving channels of their own desires, which leads to the sort of naive portrayals of um, humans and their giant robots that you see in, say, the American Transformers films in the mid-2000s. Well, it's for precisely that reason that the show Mobile Suit Gundam does not use the Slavic word robot, but instead talks about a mobile suit, which on etymological grounds, I think has a lot more to do with the idea that the robot is not just a way to perform work that the master doesn't want to do because it's tedious. Rather, the mobile suit is the ironic double of the human protagonist, which is necessary for him to answer the question with regard to his own identity at that time of his life when that is called into question. It's not a coincidence on a building's romance level that the pilot of the show is himself on the border of um, childhood and adolescence. And at this time of the teenage years when one's own identity is unclear. The mobile suit is that thing he has to merge with to find out who he himself is. And the etymology of mobile suit actually does fit with this view much better because mobile refers not just to the ability for locomotion, but to the ability for all changes, I think. We tend to think of motion as having to do only with a change in physical space. But for the uh, philosophy of Aristotle and the medieval philosophers, motion referred to all changes, but specifically in the sense of changing what is merely potential into something actual. So the mobile suit is what allows the protagonist to find out who he is through literally actualizing his own potentials. And it does so not through being a disconnected slave which performs the work he doesn't want to do, but rather through actually providing him with something to merge with. The etymology of suit is really the like French version of the Latin word sequi, which means to follow if you know the logical fallacy of a non sequitur, something which does not follow well. The suit really gives us the idea eventually with an etymology of some things which a set of things which go together and for that reason the mobile suit is the thing which goes together with its double the boy in order to allow him to actualize his own potentialities in a way that arguably would not have been possible without him. And this is, once again, a very different view of technology than would be possible in the West because these technologies are not unliving machines which can be engineered artificially to yield some result which its human makers pathologically desire. Rather, these are living in their own way because of the Shinto idea that it's not just humans who have a kami or spirit, nor is it even just living things in the traditional sense like animals and plants. It's also things like rivers, mountain sites, and even the mobile suit itself, which also have a kami. Now, the interesting thing about these mobile suits is that within this show, they were not originally designed for battle. They were rather originally designed for space colonization. They were uh, designed to allow humans to have a much finer grade of physical maneuvering within outer space than any of the older technologies would have allowed. It um, has a, an ability for fine motion within outer space because of its anthropomorphic bodily features than would be the case if one was stuck in a traditional spacecraft that basically looks like an airplane. These originally constructive 
purposes were perverted, one might argue, into the destructive purposes of warfare only as a matter of happenstance when one of these space colonies decided to rebel and start the war that would be the concern, become the concern of the show. Now, another convention which is overturned in the real robot genre which we have to discuss is the role of the patriarchal figure. A lot of super robot shows have the origin of the robot itself actually go back to some sort of father or perhaps grandfather figure, as is the case even in Mazinger Z, who invents the machine that is then used by his... Uh, typically young male successor, in order to fulfill the symbolic function of having the torch passed from the older generation to the next generation on an ideological level. The idea here is that it's not just the machine which is being passed down from the father figure to its successor, rather it's the ideology of, say, a certain kind of sense of justice, which we see being passed down in an uncomplicated and straightforward manner from the inventor down to the one who will use it. However, this sort of clean-cut transition from one generation to the next really could not be possible anymore by the time you see Mobile Suit Gundam appear, because that was a time when there was generational tension even within Japanese society itself. There was a disagreement between the younger generation and the older with regard to things like, say, nationalism or militarism within the same era that this show was produced in Japan. And you see this generational tension explicitly um, disclosed within the show Mobile Suit Gundam because the people who have to do the heavy fighting by the end of the series are all very young, but the war itself was started by their parents and grandparents, perhaps generations. It's the older generation who started the war for ideological reasons which the younger generation can identify less and less with because the father figure on a perhaps Freudian level can no longer simply provide the ego ideal for the younger generation to identify with. That is to say, the question within adolescence, who am I, can no longer be answered simply through looking at the model put forward by the father figure to answer that definitively once and for all. No, instead, within the real robot genre, one has to realize one, one one's own identity through actualizing potentials which the mobile suit allows one to realize in a way that is different than would be the case if these were just the kinds of technologies that you see either in Mazinger Z and especially within Western portrayals like Transformers. We see the father particularly problematized in Mobile Suit Gundam because in uh, one sense we abide by the convention that the machines are invented by this father figure as Amuro's own father is the one who has been developing these mobile suits which Amuro actually breaks into without permission when a few enemy invade his um, village and he is forced to jump in and start piloting actually without any explicit idea of what he's doing. He has a strange intuitive ability to fight which leads him to destroy both of these invaders ironically falling back on the sword once again to provide that finishing move but the relation to his own father despite this apparent clean-cut transition that uh, you have through the machine from the guy who invented it to the son who was able to use it so effortlessly is anything but ideal. Instead, Amuro spends most of the story uh, not even seeing his family, and at the very end, one of the mind games which is played on him by the enemy is to try to get in his head and say, you have nothing to fight for because you don't have a family who loves you anyway, which of course at the end he proves wrong in that his friends that he's been fighting on the side, same side with those are his family, which allows him to overcome this mind game. But his uh, biological family does indeed remain problematic. His mother is someone he doesn't even know is alive for much of the show and only briefly gets to see under problematic conditions. But his father is someone who, even when he does reunite with him on the uh, neutral colony side six, um, he finds that he only wants to discuss the purely pragmatic 
question of how much uh, progress has been made both uh, in the war and also with regard to the technological functions of the machines. Now we find that this is not necessarily insensitivity on the part of the father. Rather, he's literally suffered a kind of brain damage through having a lack of oxygen under the conditions he's had to live under. But this still shows that the connection between Amuro and his father figure is far more difficult to establish, if at all, within this show than would have been the case in earlier shows which, once again, portray not only the machines being handed down unproblematically from an older generation to the successor generation, but also their ideology being handed down. That's no longer really possible in uh, Mobile Suit Gundam, as even when the father does give another device to Amuro in that last meeting, um, with the promise that this device is supposed to help him win the war. When Amuro takes a closer look at it, he realizes that he's actually been given a piece of worthless junk, and the father has become so delusional that this is the only thing he can leave behind to the boy, a father who was brilliant enough on a scientific level in an earlier time to invent these machines, has now completely lost his mind. And this is a symbol, once again, of a generational tension between the older generation who started this war and the younger generation who now has to fight it. It's explicitly noted in Mobile Suit Gundam that people as young as Amuro now have to fight on the front lines because so many of the older generation have been killed off by the war. There's something like a 50% decline in population as a result of it on both of these sides. But in Freudian terms, we also see, once again, that one's own identity cannot simply be answered, the question of one's identity, by looking towards the father figure. Rather, the boy is somebody who has to answer that through dealing with his own mobile suit. Another reason why the shonen cannot simply model his own identity on that of the father figure is that it's eventually found that he's not just an ordinary boy at all. Rather, Amuro is one of those who are identified in the show as being a new type. Now, this is a very mysterious concept, which the first time you watch the show, you might be left perplexed um, even by the time you reach the end of the series with regard to what on earth this actually means. Perhaps because the show had to be finished up sooner than expected, as it failed to meet toy sale expectations. But the new type itself is something which, even on an etymological level, is actually coming from English rather than from Japanese. Within uh, the Japanese script itself, this is simply the English transliteration, new typeu, which perhaps just tells us that this is no longer... Um, referring to a person with the same sort of not only actualized abilities, but even potential abilities that the traditional human person would have, rather the new type is a certain evolution of humans themselves, actually bordering on like the supernatural. One of the events uh, that uh, displays Amuro's abilities as a new type actually has him communicating thoughts directly from his mind to the minds of others. And it's eventually uh, revealed um, that uh, the Xeon fighters themselves had had the kind of advantage they did because they were getting that kind of help from another new type who is the young girl, Lala. Now, Lala has a relation to Char on the Xeon side, which is never fully explained in that she credits him for saving her life, but we never learn what exactly was, but we do know that she's so grateful for that, that she allows him to tap into new abilities for maneuvering his own mecha because her new type abilities are supplementing them in a way that once again cannot just be explained on the sort of Kaczynski and or Lulian uh, levels of technology always squeezing human subjective abilities of mind out of the picture in order to make room for themselves. Rather, here we find a very strange reversal of that. The machine can only do the things that it does because it's being supplemented itself, not just by human mind, but by a kind of human mind which has never been seen before because this is the new type. She is revealed eventually to be able to control certain very fine-tuned weapons directly with her mind. And this is exactly what leads Amuro to also have a certain advantage which he is only able to tap into 
by the end of the show, which eventually leads him, quite frankly, to move beyond the need for the machines themselves. Now, the terminology used to describe these new type abilities include words like awakening and understanding, which imply that the mind, which has not yet evolved to new type status, is in some sense asleep rather than awake, and it's lacking in comprehension rather than have a full understanding. Standing. Now, the very strange thing about the show's portrayal of this awakening of the new type is that it actually uses an image of something like a sperm fertilizing something like an egg. This is the idea that whereas Mobile Suit Gundam would seem superficially to be about the end of life or death being fixated on the shonen concerns of outward battle, we find at the end of the show that it's actually all about the beginning, the new beginning of life, not just for humans in the traditional sense, but rather for this new kind of human we see uh, embodied in the figure of the new type. This once again calls into question the traditional Kaczynskian portrayal that humans can only have the relation to their machines of subtly, perhaps imperceptibly, having their own freedom squeezed out of the picture bit by bit until it's completely non-existent as the machines uh, continue to further themselves within a Darwinist struggle to gain any advantage over us in terms of control, etc. Rather, we find with Amuro, somebody who is engrossed in machines, even to the point that when we first see him, he's so busy working on a computer that he doesn't even remember whether he has eaten that day or not. Uh, over and over again, he has to be reminded by others to do something as basic as eating. Well, in the Kaczynski or Lulian um, view, we might assume that this is just the destruction of his mind as the machine comes to replace his with its own over time. But actually, we find within this portrayal something that cannot be quite as easily explained as that. Rather, we see something here a little closer to the ideal put forth by Robert Persage in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance that working on your machines can become something like a Zen activity under the right conditions. For we do not see the destruction of his mind, but rather we see it liberated into the new type model but precisely through breaking with the kind of ideological illusions which Zen would also help one to overcome. He cannot simply remain within the kind of box of abstractions which had been passed down from the older generation down to him in terms of things like uh, militarism and other sorts of political ideologies, as really by the end of the show we find them moving beyond the concept of warfare altogether. The war that they had to fight for their parents' generation is something which they have actually moved beyond the very need for by the end because there's a much greater emphasis on exploring the new kinds of possibilities opened up for human subjectivity in the figure of the new type.